Okay. Okay, I, 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 I kind of know what you mean, I, uh, but let's take a look at that in lab, and we can, we can figure it out. That, that makes more sense than what I was trying to understand. All right, um, we were talking about accessibility, and let me try to review and summarize the stuff that we talked about last time. Um, the first thing that we, we did, or one of the things that we did, so we identified a list of disabilities that are relevant as far as websites go. Um, that's important to do because a lot of people, when they think about website accessibility, they think just in terms of people that are visually impaired. And there's, there's a lot more to it, as we've seen, than that. So um, the relevant disabilities, the ones that we identified, and I'll probably throw a few more in that we might not have talked about. are vision issues, number one, obviously, because the web is a very visual medium. And um, that, those range from the extreme to the, to the less severe, all right? Uh, and I think we found that with all these disabilities, that um, there's the most extreme version of them, which, of course, causes the most issues when accessing the web. And then there are less extreme versions of them while maybe not as severe, still provide or, or still prove to be significant uh, difficulties when accessing the web. So with vision, we range all the way from blindness on the more severe side of the spectrum to color blindness, which we found out is not just one thing, but there are uh, different types of color blindness, to people that simply have poor vision. Uh, we talked about hearing and again can range from someone who is deaf to people who have poor hearing. Um, we talked about different um, cognitive or neurological, probably a, maybe a better way to say it. Uh, uh, maladies such as uh, dyslexia, epilepsy. We could probably add a few more uh, in this category that we didn't address, like, for example, ADHD um, and um, other just cognitive or issues. that may hamper the person's ability to read and understand the material. Um, we talked about motor control issues, or maybe we didn't. In other words, someone who has trouble uh, moving, their, moving their hands, especially, would be relevant uh, for this. And that can range all the way from the most severe cases, like someone like Stephen Hawking, who actually uses uh, something that they move with their mouth, he moves with his mouth, uh, to just people that uh, have some form of paralysis, you know, uh, is also a very severe condition, to people who just have trouble moving because due to arthritis or carpal tunnel. Um, so extreme motor control issues to less severe. Um, Trying to think, is there anything else that we missed in this list? Um, that might be related to ADHD um, or just issues with attention span. Um, I think that's all. If we think of more, we can, we can add it, I suppose. I think that is most of the relevant ones as I go through my, my uh, mental list of these. Now, uh, a sad reality, I suppose, is that there's sort of a catch-all category uh, of age-related conditions 
because as you age, you tend to have difficulties in all of these areas, all right? Um, you tend to not be able to see as well. You tend to be able to not to hear as well. You tend to have uh, some issues with memory um, or other sort of uh, cognitive issues. And you tend to have motor control issues. Either you have arthritis or whatever. So age-related conditions is sort of a catch-all category where you may not have the more severe form of the, uh, of, of the, uh, uh, of the issue, but you, you have at least a mild form uh, in, in all of these categories. Um, so I think this is a good list uh, of that. Again, the reason for this is that a lot of people, when they hear accessibility, they think websites for the blind. And I want to destroy that illusion. I've had people tell me that their website uh, was accessible because they used alt attributes on images. That's one tiny, tiny sliver of it. That would be like saying that you know our, our campus is uh, accessible because we have some handicapped parking. All right? Yeah, that's a start. That, that's a piece of the puzzle, but that's not the entire puzzle. All right? Accommodating all these conditions are, are uh, important. Um, we then talked about how two of the things that we can do, the notion of universal design, designing for everyone, not just designing for people with or without disabilities, is two of the things that we can do are or two of the principles that we can follow are simplicity and multiple presentation. Simplicity uh, relates to keeping the site simple. Things such as uh, don't have uh, gratuitous uh, animations. By gratuitous, I mean things that don't add any value to the site. Um, that is, uh, those potentially can be dangerous for people with seizures. They can be distracting for people with ADHD. All right. Um, yes. So I made sites that were simple. Uh huh. Made one for this attorney and he hated it. So how do you know it's simple? Oh, that is that is that is a excellent, excellent, excellent. Excellent question. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Uh, what about clients that say, the, here's, here, let me try to paraphrase the question. And this is, boy, I could go on for hours about this one because I've had similar experiences. The question was, is, is the student made a website for someone that was simple, but the client hated it? All right. Um, what do you do in a situation like that? Um, a lot of people have, a lot of people, especially in the past, I think people are becoming a little more sophisticated about their appreciation of good design. Uh, a lot of people in the past thought that uh, web design was merely a bunch of clever, eye-catching um, sort of things. Would you agree? Something that, like, something that would be dazzling. You know, the sizzle and not the steak, uh, you know, would, would be the thing that people would say, you know. Um, and what do you do if you design a site following principles of good web design and your client doesn't like it because they think it's boring? Well, it is possible to make a site that is too simple and is boring. But that's usually not the problem that people have. <laughs> All right. So I will say there might be some sites out there that could use a little bit of that. But I'm, I'm, based on what I've seen in your work, I really doubt that that was the case in, in this case. I'm sure you developed a really nice looking, really good functional website. One of the things you can do, if you're brought in especially, uh, if you're brought in as a consultant to develop a website for someone, uh, people that develop websites usually work in two modes. Either they're in-house or they're brought in as a consultant. If you work in-house, uh, then uh, you're part of the same organization as the people you're developing a site for. You stand a better chance there. 
because you can always, you know, always have your boss try to appeal to their boss, you know, and try to educate them. When you're brought in as a consultant and you're not really uh, part of the same team, so to speak, you have a few options to do. Uh, number one, um, part of your job, I think, as a consultant is to educate people. All right. Um, if you're doing something a certain way, uh, you probably have really good reasons for it. The people that you're developing it for don't understand web design. They don't have those skills. If, and again, I'm, I'm not saying that to criticize them or to make fun of them or whatever, all right? Because I'm sure they have skills in their area, right? I'm sure they do things that I can't do, right? But the point is, is they don't understand it and you do. You're the expert, all right, in a case like that. So if they disagree with you, part of your job is to try to educate them. So instead of simply saying, well, this is a better way to do it, part of your job is to educate them and to teach them why your way is the better way to do it. And sometimes that can be successful. All right? Sometimes that can be successful. If you have someone with an open mind that's reasonable, and you talk to them, and you can show them why it's better, you could possibly pull out materials online resources that talk about web design and talk about how you know simple and usable and things like that are, are important um, and so on what happens if they're, they're still not buying it all right <laughs> well then you sort of have a, a, a moral dilemma <laughs> you know what do you do uh, I wouldn't say moral dilemma though because I you know, this isn't this. You know, this doesn't really sound like a moral issue. It's a design issue. So, uh, you know, you could try to seek some sort of compromise, something that that it matches your uh, principles as a designer and a developer, and they think is a good job, but maybe gives them some of of, of what they're asking for, and sort of find a middle ground. Uh, at a certain point, you know, they're writing the checks. So, you know, you just got to shrug and say. Yeah, if, if they want to pay for a crappy site, I'll give them a crappy site, and they'll pay me, and it'll be happy. It's not like I'm doing, it's not like I'm robbing a bank, all right? It's not like I'm doing something immoral, you know? It's, it's I'm doing something that I don't think is my best work, but they don't want my best work, apparently, and they are stubbornly resist. And, and that's an art, the art of educating, because people don't want to be condescended to, people don't want their intelligence insulted, but... Uh, an open-minded and mature person will realize that this isn't their area, and they may have very mistaken notions about what is what is good. You know, if you were going to ask me, for example, what I would want my car to be designed like, I would, you know, I'd want it designed like the Batmobile, of course, you know, <laughs> with all these things. Now, a car designer is going to look and say, now, Mike, come on now. You don't know what you're talking about. A Batmobile is impractical on so many levels. You don't really need spikes coming out of the wheels, right? How often are, are you being chased by, you know, by spies that you need to do that? And, and it's like, then, you know, an open-minded person would say, yeah, you're right. I probably really don't need that. Uh, and then you can, you can you know, they'll educate you as to what you actually really need. Um, it's appropriate to push back, I guess is what I'm saying. It's appropriate for you to try to educate them and try to explain to them why your solution is, is better than maybe what they have in mind. When push comes to shove, and again, if, you, if you're working in-house, it's appropriate for you to talk to your manager and say, look, they want me to develop this site, but they wanted me to do it crappy, you know, and then they can maybe talk to them or talk to their boss or whatever and, and figure something out. Um, when push comes to shove, though, you know, uh, if it's something that you were, if it became a moral issue, like, for example, if they said, don't worry about accessibility, uh, where you don't worry about people that had d d disabilities, I want this flickering animation on my home page. You know, that would become possibly a moral issue. You'd say, you know what, no, I'm not going to be responsible for triggering seizures. And you could walk away from the project, I would think. Um, if, uh, uh, if it was merely a case that they wanted something that wasn't designed particularly well, but wasn't like, you know, criminally bad, then, uh, you know, they're paying the bills. You, you kind of have to decide, um, you know, probably, probably you're going to give it to them. 
Uh, a great story in, in that regard is um, I did some work for a chemical company. Let me try to pull it up. I'm not going to turn on the screen yet. Um, and this didn't affect me directly because I was doing sort of like the behind the scenes coding for it, the database work and all that, but the symbol for this chemical company for some reason or another was an alligator. I don't know why. I don't know why they're an alligator. They're, they were, maybe they were hardcoder in Florida? I don't know. I mean, but at any rate, uh, they wanted <laughs> on the homepage for the, for the alligator or crocodile or whatever it was to, bl to wink at the person. <laughs> And, and first of all, winking is one of the creepiest things that a person could do, right? Now, I don't know how that translates for alligators. It's probably creepy for alligators to wink, too. But they insisted on it. And again, our designers are like, that's going to make your page look like it's a cartoon page, you know? It's not something you're going to... And they were like, no, no, no. You know, uh, our, our, our customers, they identify with the crocodile. They love, the, or alligator, or whatever it is. Uh, they love it. They blah, blah, blah. It's like they'll get a kick out of it. And, and again, when push came to shove, when that was released, we had a winking alligator on, on their home page. Because again, that's not something like ethical, you know. It wasn't the kind of animation that's going to trigger a seizure or something like that. It, it is, it's something that was dumb. And we gave all the reasons why it probably wasn't a good idea. And they looked and they said, yeah, I think, okay, we understand that, but, you know, we want it to wig. So, and again, this is, again, it was like you said, this was years ago. So, uh, uh, in, in the old days, uh, you know, kind of gimmicky things like that were a little more common on the web. Let me, exactly. Let me try to find this. Archived. Still live. It's still live, but it looks diff I'm sure it looks different. Oh, no, this is before. Oh, this is great. I, I know what I'm doing the rest of. Oh, here we go. All right, here's our website now. All right. Let's say it's still probably a little too busy, but all right, it's, it's not, it doesn't look horrible. Here is the dreaded winking alligator. Uh, well, yeah, I'm not going to speculate, you know, maybe fumes or something. I don't know. Yeah. And again, it blinks. I rate that it blinks at, but uh, it's pretty slow. This isn't like seizure uh, inducing animation, but again, they fought tooth and nail against this, and they insisted. This, by the way, is a great utility. Uh, Archive.org has snapshots of different web pages. Now, they're not fully functional, of course, because they don't have the databases and stuff behind them. But you can go back and find uh, versions of websites from a long time ago. This is useful in this class, because a lot of times I'll find a, bad ex a good example of bad web design, and I'll use it, and <laughs> I almost said a bad word. The jerks go and correct their bad design, right? So, like, I can't use this as an example anymore, you know? And then I have to find another example of bad design. Well, with the Wayback Machine, you can actually, uh, you can actually uh, go and uh, uh, find what the website looked like. What cartoon is the Wayback Machine a tribute to? That's a trivia question for today. The Wayback Machine, what cartoon was that in? I think so. I think it's, uh, P yeah, I think it's Peabody and Sherman. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyhow, the Wayback Machine. Yeah, the Internet Archive. Uh, that, 
Uh, not so much that, a little bit that, but but definitely Rocky and Bullwinkle was way over my head when I was a kid. Um, for one thing, the villain's name was Boris Badenov, all right? There actually is a historical Russian figure named Boris Goodenoff, and so Badenov was kind of like uh, the opposite of Goodenoff, and it was like, I didn't get that till I was like in my 50s, and I first heard that joke when I was probably 10, so it took 40 years for that joke to finally like kick in in my head. Anyhow, what you can do is you can put in a website, and you could go back. So this is what it looked like before we got to it. This is early 2001, all right? And, and again, um, our version of the site that we did later in 2001, even with the winking alligator, looks a lot better than this, all right? So we did make progress uh, on this. But this is kind of fun. We can see, let's see what Lorraine Community, oh, Let's see what our uh, Lorraine Community College's page looked like back then. First appeared in 1997. Yeah, that is a great old version, old, old school thing, the visitor counter. But anyhow, this is a, this is a great tool to go and use and, and pull up old, old things. I actually use this um, as, and again, I'm, I'm sort of digressing. At this point of the semester, this happens with a greater increasingly, uh, more uh, increasing rate that I, I start digressing. Like, eventually I'll digress like at least once a class. Then pretty much the whole classes will be digressions, you know. But uh, I do think it's good stuff. I actually use this site to recover someone's website because they had a website and they had a disagreement with their hosting company. And their hosting company really botched it because they weren't able to provide files to them, backups or something like that. Um, and it was really a mess. And this person lost their website and they wanted to migrate it to a new platform anyhow. So I actually used this to pull up an old version of their website, cut and paste the text, uh, save the images, you know, save as, right mouse on the image and save as and, and all that to actually recover someone's website. So this has, this has more uh, valid purposes than just going back and reminiscing, all right? Um, ideally, uh, URLs on a website should never die, right? In other words, if there's a URL, there should be a well-designed website, a URL that was valid in 1997 will still be valid today, all right? But you know that's not the case. Uh, so if there was material that you wanted to find that wasn't, uh, that's no longer available on the web, you can use this as well. If, like, I, I know there was a page on Lorraine Community College's site that said such and such. Well, you can actually go back and see, even if it's not still available. All right. So, back to this. Simplicity and multiple presentation. That was a great question about what do you do when people aren't buying the whole simplicity thing. And that's usually the argument people give, that it's boring, all right? And again, you have to uh, distinguish that they're not going to be printing this out and putting it on the refrigerator. You, people are going to be using your site to do something. So you want usable more than exciting, all right, for a website. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't want to make it attractive. Uh, simplicity doesn't have to equate to boringness, I guess, well designed. If you go, like, for example, to Apple's site, you know, um, Apple's site is very simple. And I suppose there are people that would describe this as boring, but most people would probably say that this is a pretty well designed site. Sophisticated, right. Right. Okay. 
So besides simplicity, the other thing, and in a way that sort of contradicts it, because in one end we're talking about keeping it simple, but in another end we're saying multiple presentations. In other words, show the same thing the same, uh, two different ways. Well, isn't that the opposite of the simple? Well, in a way it is. And that's where the balancing active design comes in. All right? Being able to, in a simple way, present things, not just one way, but two ways. All right? So, for example, and we could go down all of these to talk about um, multiple presentations. With vision, for someone who's blind, yes, we do have all text that can describe what the image is. For someone who's colorblind, don't use color by itself to show, to represent something. Use color and some other typographical technique, like make it bold and red, make it italics and red, put a border around it and make it red. All right, all those things will, will make, like if you wanted text on a page to stand out, all those things are multiple presentation, yet they're not going to be, uh, you know, they're, they're still going to be simple. And there's, they're not going to violate trying to make it simple. So incorporating a couple ways of doing things doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to be simple. All right? And it's a balancing act. Uh, poor vision. Being able to scale the fonts easily. Now, fortunately for us, browsers have the ability to uh, zoom in and zoom out on things. So a lot of that has been taken care of us through the technology. Hearing. We talked about providing transcripts or providing captions. Uh, cognitive neurological, dyslexia, breaking things down into easy chunks, um, using readable fonts. Oh, the other thing with uh, color blindness would be using good color combinations, or even allow people to customize the color combinations. Dyslexia, breaking things down to chunks, using images along with pictures, that the picture will help put the text in context for the person. So if they're having trouble understanding something, they can look at the picture and maybe get a sense of what it's about. All right, epilepsy, avoiding animations that don't add anything to the page, avoiding certain types of animations, ones that have a lot of flicker. Um, if you absolutely have to have an animation on your page, like maybe you're demonstrating something, uh, you know, you're showing how cells divide, I think was the example. First of all, make sure the animation is not one that flickers at a certain rate and can trigger seizures, but give the person an alternative. Warn them that the next page contains an animation. If you prefer, view this page, and this page could have, instead of an animation, could have simply a series of images that would show it. Again, keeping things well organized, divided into sections, and all that uh, is effective. Motor control issues. Don't make tiny little links to click on. All right? Um, allow people to use keyboard shortcuts to uh, hit a link. All right? That's a possibility, too. And again, we, we talked about people that are visually impaired. They can use the keyboard to navigate through if they don't want to use that, um, you don't want to use the mouse. Age-related conditions, again, are a little bit of all of these. The other conclusion that we had about this is that um, all the things we're doing for, for accessibility will benefit people uh, that don't have those issues at least some of the time, all right? The one example I gave is a, a video clip that also has a transcript. Uh, I read really fast, all right? So if I see a five-minute video clip, I might think, do I want to watch this or not? I don't know, five minutes is an awful long time to, to spend, <laughs> you know, watching a video clip. Uh, isn't that weird how we say that? Like five, I'd have to sit there for five whole minutes, yeah. Uh, but the fact is, is if there was a transcript for it, I could probably skim through the transcript in 30 seconds and then decide, yes, I want to read it, no, I don't want to read it. Now, I will say, news organizations and other sites make things videos for slightly nefarious reasons. Why do you think they make things videos and force you to watch them? So they can throw their ads in, right? Uh, if, if it's text on a page, I can, my eyes are trained to skip ads, <laughs> all right? But if it's in the video in your face, there's really... Um, 
less that you can do about it. Um, but anyhow, all these things benefit people uh, under other circumstances. Um, and again, some of these things are simply a matter of good design. Um, the, um, oh, what was it? I just lost my train of thought. Oh, who doesn't want their, the content on a page well organized and broken down into chunks? Of course you do, you know? Everyone wants that. Who doesn't want fonts that are easy to read? Who doesn't want the ability to customize things? Even if it's for something so trivial as I can make it my favorite colors, well, hey, you're going to like the site more, you might use it more, all right? Um, so all the things that we can do for people with disabilities also benefit uh, people without disabilities. And in addition, um, if they don't benefit people, they're easily ignored. There's a great example of this on LC's page, and I'm going to turn on the screen reader. Because this is something we might have missed last time. Narrator, got it. Button, ease of access center, start narrator button, alt plus n, narrator reads aloud text on the screen. All right, I'm going to pull up LC's web page, and you're going to hear as I navigate through center, the links. Start magnifier button, alt plus g, magnify, start narrator button, volume control. How about I'll turn it down for a second. Uh, when I load LC's page, you're going to hear, as I navigate through the links using the tab, you're going to hear one link that says skip to content. All right? Uh, and we'll talk about that link in, uh, in a second here. All right? So let me turn this on. Volume 9, 100. Ease of access center. Start on screen keyboard button. Ease of access center. Set up high contrast button. Alt plus U. I start magnifier button, Alt plus G, magnifier enlarges part of the screen, tool tip, stop loading this page, start narrator button, Alt plus N, tool tip, university partnership, Lorraine County, ease of access center, start on screen keyboard button, Alt plus K, on screen keyboard makes it possible to type using the mouse or ease of access center, set up high contrast button, control panel home, link Lorraine County Community College real education real jobs a real future ease of access center start narrator button alt plus n narrator reads aloud text on the tab ease of access center start on screen keyboard button alt plus k tool to close that window running applications micro Lorraine County Community College, yeah. real education, real jobs, a real future, tab, 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 tab. Tool tip, tool tip, stop loading this tab, tab. Okay, isn't doing it. A lot of these pages have what narrator is called settings. press any key on the exiting narrator. A skip the content link. What that is is notice what it was doing. It was reading the same links over and over for us. You can actually put a skip to content link on the page. And you'll put it at the top of the page. Right here, very first thing.
skip link, skip the content. CSS will make that invisible. It's the very first thing on the page. So if you are navigating this with the screen reader, this is invisible, but the screen reader will read it to you. If you skip the content, it will skip all through, it will skip over the uh, navigation links and take you to the skip link section of the page. href content, that's what I'm looking for. Try this. Yeah, right here. That's past all those links. So someone with a screen reader comes, a screen reader comes along, hits that page, it says skip the content, they can press that link and skip over all those navigation links. So that's a neat little thing that people can do. And with CSS, you can make that invisible, so it doesn't bother people that can see the material. Um, that, they, that, that can see, they won't see those links. All right. I think that wraps it up for, and we, one thing to remind you is we did have uh, a, um, we did have some tools that covers uh, accessibility. I'd like to talk about what we're going to talk about the rest of the semester, because we have three main topics uh, the rest of the semester. And I want to remind you, your design is due next week. Completing your project is sort of job one for the rest of the semester. You're going to still have assignments, but keep in mind that the project is worth a lot of points compared to the assignments. So uh, just about any day, if you have questions about your assignments, uh, uh, or your project rather, uh, bring them up in class or talk about them in lab. I would suggest for you to show other people in class what you've done so far on the project, the prototype, the design document, and so on, and get their feedback before you turn it in. If you want, I can take a look at it as well. So from now on to the rest of the semester, I won't necessarily devote classroom time to it unless people have questions. All right, But if people do have questions, then I recognize this is a very important thing, and, and therefore I will make an effort to cover it. The topics for the rest of the semester include, and we have after today, we have five more weeks. This is the end of week 10. So we'll spend roughly a week and a half on each of these, plus or minus. First topic that we're going to talk about is forms. Forms is a way for the user to send information to the server to be processed. So we're going to talk about, we're not going to do any, but we're going to talk about uh, server-side scripting, which is sort of the next topic after this class will be one of the other next topics that you'll uh, would probably want to investigate. So we're going to talk about forms. That's a piece of this whole server-side scripting issue. We're going to talk about tables. And then we're going to talk about JavaScript. So a week to two weeks on each of these for a total of five weeks. All right. Um, now, these two things have accessibility issues. So I am going to talk about how to make these things accessible. So I'll spend some time not just talking about how to do it, but how to make them accessible. Yes? Accessible, well, OK. For example, a form, a login form. There's a lot of things that people that can see 
a lot of information that people can see that they don't even realize their eyes are giving them that information. Let's find an example. Let's go, let's go and try to uh, register for an account on Amazon. All right. We have a form that we have to enter here. This is a form. We're going to send information to the Amazon server to be processed. What does this box represent? What am I supposed to type in here? All right, your name. How did you know that? Because the label is right next to it. All right? You can visually, I was going to say you can visually see, but how else can you see? You can see that this is close to this, therefore these two things are related. That's a conclusion you make based on the ability to, to see, that you have vision. People that are navigating this page using the tab key that cannot see the screen are liable to end up in a field like this, and if the site isn't defined with accessibility in mind, have no idea what they're supposed to put into it. I have a text box that I'm supposed to put data in. What am I supposed to put in here? My name, my email address, um, my date of birth, you know, my address. What we can do with forms to make them accessible is we can create a mechanism by which the label is linked to the form element. Tables are the same way. Tables are like Excel spreadsheets, rows and columns. And uh, people that can see can line up the rows and columns to find out that this cell means the average temperature in Cleveland in January, for example. But if you can't see, it's hard to make that association. So there's things that we can do to make those accessible. All right, so that's two of the things we'll talk about, and we'll talk about JavaScript. Mixed in with that, of course, is your project is job one for the rest of the semester. This is the rarest of all days. I'm actually ending early instead of going overtime. So um, I'll be up in lab. All right, see you there.